Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Excellent. Should I get started? Wonderful. Thank you for uh, taking time to see my presentation. Uh, this is my first campus party, so I'm delighted to be here with all of you. Um, so I don't know. You guys know about Justice 2.0, so I'm going to dive right into it. Um, I don't know if you know anything about me. Uh, I'm COO and co-founder of a company in Silicon Valley called Modria. And I was the director of online dispute resolution at eBay and PayPal for eight years prior to founding Modria five years ago. So my expertise is called online dispute resolution. And Modria stands for Modular Online Dispute Resolution Implementation Assistance. So we're going to talk about justice today. Uh, how many of you have had a dispute on eBay or PayPal? Raise your hand. Or Mark Plotz, maybe. All right. A couple of you. You mind tell me a little bit about your dispute? What was it? Did you buy an item and you didn't get it? That's what it was. Did you eventually get it, or did you get a refund? Did you get a refund from the seller or a refund from from eBay or PayPal? From PayPal. All right, great. What I always say is, if you have a dispute on eBay or PayPal and you got a refund, that's my that's my process. I did that for you. If you have a dispute on eBay or PayPal and you didn't get a refund. I haven't worked at eBay and PayPal for years, so I don't know. They've really screwed everything up since I left. But how long ago was it that, that you had the dispute? Five years ago. Okay. So, yeah, I was still there at that time. So what did you buy? Do you mind me asking? Uh, an SD card. Okay. Sounds good. Probably that SD card, if you paid $24, you know, 20 or 50 bucks for it back then, is like $5 now. So, yeah. But, okay, well, that's great. So you got a refund. How about, uh, ma'am? You said you had a dispute. Was it on eBay or PayPal? eBay, okay. Did you get your money back? Okay. Was it from eBay or from the seller? It was from the seller. What was the item? Do you mind me asking? It was an iPod? Okay, sounds good. Well, that's a pretty big purchase. So, all right, well, well, that's, these are good examples. I'm interested to hear more, but... Uh, there are lots and lots and lots of these disputes, not just at places like eBay or PayPal. You can imagine mark plots. Obviously, people are getting together face-to-face -face like classified sites. Those are lots of disputes. But there are also disputes for sites like Airbnb or Couchsurfing. Hosts and guests have disputes. Or you can imagine sites like Uber. They have disputes. Or where you rent a car where someone maybe has an accident. Uh, you can imagine there are disputes at sites like TaskRabbit, all the collaborative economy sites. They all have disputes. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of disputes, hundreds of millions of disputes. Now, the question is, what is the justice system going to look like in five years, in 10 years? FinTech, financial technology, is a huge space. It's an $8 billion space. The law, courts, lawyers around the world, that's a $450 billion space. But if you look at the way the law works today, it pretty much works the same way it worked 20 years ago, or 40 years ago, or 60 years ago. The law has not yet been transformed by technology. Finance has been transformed. Medicine has been transformed. Entertainment has been transformed, but not the law. Why is that? Why hasn't the legal system been transformed? It's because the lawyers have a monopoly, and they're very good at protecting their monopoly. But if you had a blank piece of paper and you were going to redesign the justice system from scratch, the global justice system, no courts, no police, no jails, if you were to redesign the system, would you make a system that looks like the one we have today? Probably not. Probably not. Because of situations like eBay. Where was the seller for your SD card, sir? UK. And you were located where? Are you in the Netherlands? In Italy. In Italy. Okay. Well, Europe has a huge problem with cross-border disputes. Now, why is this a problem? 20 years ago, it was not a problem because you probably would have bought your SD card in Italy. It might have been a little bit more expensive. Well, there was no SD card 20 years ago, but you get my drift. Uh, Italian buyers bought from Italian sellers, and UK buyers bought from UK sellers. But now, I can pull out my phone. Everybody here has a phone. You can swipe, swipe, swipe. You can buy something from China. And they'll ship it to you very cheap. But what happens when a problem arises? Where do, you, where do you go to get redress? If you go to your local court, where are you from in Italy? Tuscany. So if you go to a local court in Tuscany and you don't get your purchase from China or from the UK and you file a case, why does the seller care? They probably don't because that court in Tuscany has no authority over the seller uh, in the UK. You could file a case in the UK 
but that's expensive. You have to find a lawyer to represent you. And how much is the SD card? It's not that much money. So what we're talking about is we now have a new problem. We have a global e-commerce situation where consumers are buying hundreds of millions of items and they cannot get redressed because the justice system that we have is too based on geography. It's too based on boundaries and laws. And it's too based on a person where you can go and arrest them and put them in jail. You can't do that online. We can change our identities very quickly. So this quote is talking about what is justice? What is the legal system built to do? Why does it exist? And my argument is the legal system exists to prevent and resolve disputes. Preventing disputes means preventing a problem from arising in the first place. And resolving a dispute means if a problem does arise, how do you get a fast and fair resolution to that dispute? So you buy an iPod, the iPod doesn't arrive, you want a fast and fair resolution. Now, in the courts, what's a fast and fair resolution? Maybe a year, maybe two years. I know in Italy, if you file a civil case, it can take seven years, eight years. In India, it takes 10 years or 13 years from filing a case to get in front of a judge. That doesn't work. That doesn't work in the era of the internet. We all want it to be 24 seven online. We wanna resolve disputes, click resolution. So the question is, how can we build a justice system that can take the law, take the courts, take all of that, and update it so that it works for the new world that we're building? That's what I'm gonna talk about today. Now, online dispute resolution, my expertise, I've written a couple books on this, and I'm coming from The Hague. We just had a conference at the Peace Palace where we brought in all of the international experts about online dispute resolution, and we talked about how can we use these tools to build the next justice system. Online dispute resolution is the use of information or communications technologies to help people resolve their disputes. So it's not just resolve, it's also prevent their disputes. And that doesn't just mean the internet. The internet is a very powerful dispute resolution technology, but there are lots of other dispute resolution technologies. Another one is the phone. The phone is a very powerful dispute resolution technology. So let me talk about eBay for a minute. I joined eBay in 2003. We created something called the Resolution Center eBay had about 250 million users at the time that I joined. Every user got their own resolution center. It's a software-powered console where they can log in and they can file new disputes and they can track those disputes to resolution. We had a wide variety of different kinds of problems at eBay. One is what you experienced. That's called an INR, an item not received dispute. Another kind is a not as described dispute where you buy something and you get it and it's different than you thought it was going to be. Maybe you buy a beautiful new laptop and they send it to you and it's old and it doesn't have the memory they promised and it doesn't work. Or maybe you bought a laptop and you get the box and you open it up and it has a brick in it. That's a little bit more of a problem. That's fraud. So we have item not received disputes and we have not as described disputes. Those are both buyer initiated problems, but we also have seller initiated problems. You know eBay is an auction marketplace. So buyers bid on items sometimes, and sometimes they win those items, and then they don't follow through and pay. So we call those unpaid item disputes. That's a very huge volume. But at eBay and PayPal, we did 60 million disputes a year in 16 different languages all over the world. And a lot of these disputes were between people in different countries. And we looked at the justice system and we said, we looked at lawyers, we looked at judges, is it relevant to these kinds of disputes? And the answer is no. The average value of a dispute at eBay is about $75. So that's not enough. You're not gonna get a lawyer, you're not gonna take it to court, but you do need to get a fast and fair resolution. Because if you have a bad experience, if you buy an item and you can't solve that problem, you're not gonna buy another item on eBay. You're gonna go to Amazon. And that's pretty much what a lot of people are doing. They're going to Amazon because Amazon, if you have a problem and you call them up, they just give you your money back. So at eBay, we had to build the resolution center because we're talking about sellers and buyers. eBay is not a seller. eBay doesn't hold any of the items. We have to resolve disputes between sellers and buyers. So we wrote a software program to resolve those disputes. 60 million disputes a year is more disputes than are filed in the entire US court system. And this number is growing at 20% a year right? Because e-commerce is growing at 20% a year. So we wrote a software program, the Resolution Center, and 50% of the disputes, the 60 million, were resolved amicably, meaning the buyer and the seller worked out a solution between the two of them that was okay. And 90% of those disputes were resolved in, in software only, meaning no human from eBay ever had to touch the dispute. So now we're starting to talk about 
AI. We're starting to talk about algorithmic resolutions. How do you write a software program that can convene conversations between millions and millions of buyers and sellers in order to get them to work out their problems? And now, is this a possibility to take some of this technology and expand it out of e-commerce and deal with other kinds of disputes, okay? The other thing that's very important is this entire resolution process that we built is extrajudicial, meaning none of the decisions that we delivered are enforceable in a court. You can't take an eBay decision and go to a judge or go to a court and say, eBay decided this, you have to enforce the outcome. This process is entirely separate from the courts. But what we found is 99.999% of the disputes that we resolved at eBay, they were never appealed to the courts. We didn't block the consumers. They could go to court if they wanted to, but no one ever did because they found that this process was trustworthy enough to be a fair resolution to the issue. And then people moved on with their lives. Okay, so let's talk about this from the e-commerce perspective first. The reality is the courts do not work for online disputes. They simply don't work. There is no way that we can take the law the way it currently works and apply it to these high volume, low value, cross-border disputes and make a resolution process that operates. So companies like eBay are building their own justice systems. That's what eBay asked me to do, build a civil justice system for all of our 250 million users. Now, 250 million users, that's a lot of users. I would go to conferences like this and I would say, if you counted up all of eBay's users as citizens, we would be the fifth largest country in the world, which is pretty impressive. But then I was on a panel with a guy from Facebook and he said, well, we have 1.3 billion users. And if you counted our users as citizens, we'd be the third largest country in the world. And we're gaining on number two, which is India. So my, my 250 million didn't sound very impressive anymore. But if you look at the growth of some of these sites, not just e-commerce, you have eBay, you have Amazon, you have Alibaba and Taobao in China. These are huge sites. But think about the other kinds of disputes that are arising in social networks that are getting bigger all the time as well. We need to figure out a way to resolve bullying disputes. We need to figure out a way to, to solve intellectual property disputes. How are we going to do that with the existing system? So my argument is online dispute resolution works the way the internet works. You don't have to have one court that's overseeing the whole world with the ability to go out and arrest people. You can build resolutions into the transaction environments. Every single website needs to have its own resolution center. Every user needs to have a resolution center where they can push a button on a mobile app or on a website, report a problem, and get an instant resolution. And the vast majority of those resolutions must be algorithmic. They must come from AIs or algorithms that can look at their information, make a quick calculation, and decide the appropriate outcome. That's the kind of resolution that delights customers. Not picking up the phone, not getting on an online chat, not waiting, you know, the phone tree where they say, press one for this, press two. No one likes that. That is very 1986. That is gone. Now we need to have algorithmic resolutions. So what I want you guys to get excited about is think about a kind of dispute in your head and then think, what, what would these approaches look like if we applied it to those kinds of disputes? All right. Right now, online dispute resolution is being pushed very, very hard by governments all around the world because they've looked at this problem and they know the existing judicial system can't keep up. Already lawyers, lawyers are having problems getting new cases because the services that they offer are not relevant to these types of transactions. So we're talking about relatively low dollar value civil transactions, okay? Not criminal. Criminal's a different story. At eBay, my department was in a group called Trust and Safety. That was the name of my team. And in Trust and Safety, we said there were three pillars to Trust and Safety. One is resolutions. That's what I did. Two is fraud investigations. So you have to get the bad guys. You cannot create a negotiation between a criminal and their victim. That doesn't make any sense. If somebody, and there are people that go to work every day in suits, in high rises, and their job is to defraud eBay and PayPal members. These are very smart guys with PhDs in computer science. For a while, eBay was the num uh, PayPal was the number one spoofed site on the internet. And everybody got fraud, fake PayPal emails all the time. So we need to have resolutions, but we also need to have fraud investigations. The third part of trust and safety is reputation. And eBay has, has, and, had, has and had the largest reputation system in the world, which is the feedback system. So you probably have seen when you do a transaction on eBay, you can leave a positive, a neutral, or a negative for the other side. Why is that important? Because every single user in the system needs to be able to look at every other user and see, are they trustworthy? 
can I engage with in a transaction with them and know I will not have a problem? So that information transparency is crucial to dispute prevention. And I'll give you some examples about how that works. But fraud investigations, resolutions, and reputation, those all must work in very close partnership to make sure you can create trust and safety within a marketplace. So that we're extending that to other marketplaces. Now, the UN just finished a five-year working group on online dispute resolution, and they created a description for a, a, a system that would be a global cross-border small claims resolution system. Whereas if I'm a buyer in India and I have a dispute with a seller in the United States, I can file that case locally in India and then a local consumer protection organization in the United States will contact the seller and there's reciprocal jurisdiction. So Unsatral has just created this design. Now the question is, is country, are countries going to adopt it? The EU just passed a regulation which came into effect in February which says every merchant in the EU now has to provide a link to their consumers that shows them how to file a dispute. And if you don't put that link on your website, you're subject to civil penalties. So far, nobody's adopted it yet. So uh, the EU has also created an intake form where any consumer can file a dispute and report it to the EU, and then they pass it out to online dispute resolution organizations around the world. So you see the EU moving fast on this. We also see in the UK, they've created something called Her Majesty's Online Court. And this is an online courthouse for disputes, civil disputes, less than 50,000 pounds, where you're not required to get a lawyer and you're not required to show up in person. But you can file a case and you can carry that case through to resolution and the outcome that you get from Her Majesty's online court has the same force, the same enforceability as a decision that you get from a judge in person. The same thing is happening in British Columbia in Canada. They've created something called a civil resolution tribunal. So what are we seeing? We're seeing experiments that are starting to digitize the justice process and to use the kind of approaches, approaches that I'm talking about here. Now I'm about to show you some screenshots which I think are going to make this a lot more real. But the point that I'm making is anyone who's looked seriously at this challenge of building the next justice system, they realize you've got to do it with the kinds of tools we have in online dispute resolution. You can't use the traditional legal model. It's too expensive, it's too tied to jurisdiction, and it doesn't scale. Okay, now let's think broadly about all the different areas where this is relevant. I'm talking about online only disputes, right? So those are disputes between two people that met on the internet, they engaged in a transaction, they have no past relationship, and they don't live in the same geography, so it's impractical for them to get together face to face. But there are many kinds of disputes that are actually in-person disputes. Think about an automobile accident where two cars smash into each other. You have an insurance case that you need to work out. Or think about a landlord-tenant situation where you have a couple roommates and a landlord and there's damage to the property and they need to work it out. Who's going to pay what? What roommate is responsible for what payment? Or think about a workplace dispute where maybe you're injured on the job or you're harassed at work and you want to file a case and you want to get some money from the employer. All of these cases are low dollar value civil cases and online dispute resolution is relevant to them. So we talk about here e-commerce disputes and that's not just marketplaces. As I mentioned, it's also merchants, direct merchants, and it's also payment providers. I started out at eBay and I moved to PayPal because it makes more sense for the dispute resolution to live where the money moves because that's how we enforce the outcome. So, but also we have public disputes. We are the number one company in the United States for online property tax assessment appeals. We do all of the property tax assessment appeals in New Orleans, Louisiana, Nashville, Tennessee, Atlanta, Georgia, Gainesville, Florida, Durham, North Carolina, Vancouver, BC, lots of cities. So this is when you get the bill from the government and it says your house or your apartment is worth this amount of money. So that means you owe the state in taxes this amount of money in property taxes. And you may say, whoa, that amount is way too high. My house is not worth that much. We write the software that lets citizens appeal that and say, hey, our valuation is too high. We need to lower that amount. So I can show you a little bit about how that works too. But that also is a transactional dispute. Now, that's all local. At least in the United States, your property tax bill comes from your assessor, and that's in your county. So that's not too far from your house. But everybody still wants to do it online. The preferences are off the charts for wanting to resolve these disputes through an online mechanism as opposed to through a face-to-face -face meeting. So we also have product liability. Imagine you use a product, you use a drug, or you eat some food, and it makes you very sick. And you have to go to the doctor, and you pay some bills at the, to the doctor. And then you contact the company that made the food or the medicine, and you say, look, you need to pay me some money because I had some costs associated with that. We build systems that resolve those disputes. Also, we do insurance cases. 
So if you get into an automobile accident and you have medical costs, we can resolve the dispute between the insurance company and the medical provider. So these are lots of different examples and also court cases. So essentially, the way we think about all of these disputes is very straightforward. Modria stands for Modular Online Dispute Resolution. We build Legos, building blocks, and then we can assemble appropriate resolution processes for any kind of dispute. So what you see up here are four building blocks. Problem diagnosis, negotiation, mediation, and then arbitration or evaluation. So let me go through each of these. Problem diagnosis is like a wizard. It's like an online website that you find and you ask it questions. Do I have a strong case? How much money can I get back? How long is it going to take? I can show you some examples of how this works, and I will in a second with some screenshots. But that's very, very powerful. That's not something that happens in the face-to-face -face world. I've done more than a 1,000 face-to-face mediations. And in face-to-face -face mediations, usually the parties negotiate with each other, and they get very frustrated, and then they call me only after they've reached impasse, meaning they can't resolve the issue themselves. Online, however, with diagnosis wizards, I can talk to the complainant, say the consumer or the, the tenant or whoever is initiating the case, I can provide information to them before they even communicate with the other side, before they even tell the respondent that they have an issue. I can set expectations. I can let them know what their rights are. I can show them other resolutions to similar kinds of disputes that say, oh, okay, well, that might be a good way for me to resolve my issue. So diagnosis is very powerful, and I'm going to show you with a very complicated dispute type in a second. All right, the second part is negotiation. You guys know what negotiation is, right? We all negotiate all the time. We negotiate with our kids. We negotiate with our parents. We negotiate with our boss. When you buy a car, you negotiate. What's the price going to be? Everyone's always negotiating. But direct negotiation between two parties can be helped by technology. You can create an environment where the two people communicate with each other and they make offers. Hey, I'll give you $1,000 to resolve this case. Oh, no, I want $2,000 to resolve this case. Or maybe you can provide them a key piece of information. At eBay, we had a, the number one kind of dispute that we had from buyers at eBay was exactly what we just talked about, item not received. I bought my item and I didn't get it. And the number one resolution to that dispute was the item arrived. So what happened? The seller shipped the item to the buyer, and it took a long time. And the buyer started to get worried. Where's my item? Where's my item? Now, in a lot of those cases, the buyer would file a chargeback, or the buyer would file a dispute. But they would come in, and they would say to eBay, hey, I bought this item, and it hasn't arrived yet. I think this guy may be defrauding me. He may be a bad guy. I want you to look into it. But eBay may have a tracking number. The seller may have given us a tracking number for that shipment. And we can use an API, and we can go to the shipper and look it up, and we can say, hey, that item was shipped within 24 hours after you bought it, and it's en route, and right now it's in wherever. Right now it's in Nice, and it's on its way to Rome, and it should be in Tuscany soon after that. So then the, the, the buyer goes, oh, okay, let me wait five more days, and then the item arrives. So you can resolve a lot of disputes with a key piece of information in the diagnosis phase or in the negotiation phase. Now, mediation is where you have a third party not involved in the dispute. So they're not one of the disputants. They're a separate expert, and they come in to assist the negotiation. They don't have any power to decide the case. All they're helping to do is to clarify issues, ask questions, make suggestions, reframe the issue. So mediation is not useful in all cases. The last step is arbitration. And this is what we think of like a court, where a third party comes in, they talk to both sides, they gather the information, and they render a decision. So the beauty of arbitration is it provides an answer in 100% of cases. But arbitration is very expensive. So you can think of each of these modules like a filter. And at eBay, we called it drinking from the fire hose. We had 60 million cases coming in. We only had 25,000 employees. There's no way that we could work all those cases. So the beauty of diagnosis and negotiation, do I have a laser here? Yeah. The beauty of diagnosis and negotiation is it's all software. We can deliver that software at scale, and if it's really smart, if that software is really smart, we can resolve 90% of cases before it gets to mediation and arbitration, which are the manual processes, the human-powered processes. So let me make this a little more real for you, okay? Because we're talking at a high level. Why don't we dive in and look at an example of how a system works? Now, I could show you an e-commerce case, but that's pretty simple. So I'm going to show you the hardest kind of case that, that we work with. Divorce, okay? We build a system for the Dutch Legal Aid Board, and it's called the Rechtweiser. 
So in the Netherlands, 75% of divorces in the Netherlands are paid for either fully or partially by the government. So the last 25% are people with very high incomes. They have to handle it themselves. But what this means is the Dutch Legal Aid Board did an experiment with us to write a piece of software that would help a couple who is thinking about getting a divorce and then take them through the divorce and take it all the way through to the divorce being filed with the case, the court, and then even after the divorce being filed with the court. So this is a great platform, and I'll show you what it looks like in Dutch in a minute. This is the English translation. This is live right now. If any of you are Dutch and you want to get a divorce, rectvisor.modri.com, go for it. Uh, you can go try it out. Um, if your income is low enough, it'll be free. But uh, if uh, your income is a little bit higher, maybe you have to pay a little bit of money. Um, so I'm very proud of the fact that I've helped a lot of people get divorced in the Netherlands. But we've launched this software now in the UK for an organization called Relate. They're the number one family charity that does divorce. And we've also launched it in Canada, in British Columbia. So there are people all around the world. Now, when I started doing online dispute resolution 20 years ago, my policy was no divorce, no family disputes. Because I thought it's such an emotional dispute. It's the people know each other so well, and they probably are in the same place. It didn't make sense to do it online. But what's changed in the last 20 years? Now, not only do we get divorced online, this is how we find our spouses online. Everybody's using Grindr and Tinder and Match.com, and you're swiping right and swiping left. My kids, my teenagers, they make up online. They break up online. I mean, my, supposedly my son has a girlfriend. I've never met her. They only hang out on Skype. So eventually they're going to break up, and it's going to happen online. They're not going to need a divorce, hopefully, but uh, we'll see. So let me walk through this process, and I'm going to show you how this works, okay? Now, we have a map that we've created we worked with an organization in The Hague called HEAL, the Hague Institute for Innovations in Law. And HEAL convened a working group of family mediators, family attorneys, family court judges, social workers, psychologists, and we came up with what we call a justice journey. This is a journey that starts at the absolute earliest moment. So imagine, I don't know how many of you are married, but if you are, you've probably had a fight, a pretty tough fight. And imagine you're in that fight and you say, you know what? I might need to get a divorce. I might need to end this. What's the first thing that you do? You've never had a divorce before. You don't know anything about it. What's the first thing you do? You go to Google. You go to Google. You open up a browser, and you type in divorce. What's Dutch for divorce? Okay, you type in that. I don't know what it is, but that's what it is. So you type that in. You don't know anything about divorce. We want our site to be the first result. We want that to be the first result that comes up. So what do you, you don't know anything about divorce. You don't know what your rights are. You don't know what the law is. You don't know even what the process looks like. So the first step is diagnosis. And this is what the diagnosis process looks like. You come in. You're not even putting in your name. We don't know anything about you. You haven't created an account. You haven't done anything. The goal of this process is to start to educate you and ask you questions. Now, maybe you don't know that you want to get a divorce. Maybe you want to try and fix it. Maybe you want to test the strength of your relationship. Maybe you want to know what are some communication tips that we can use to work it out. So we have all of this here. We have relationship tests. We have ways that you can go and say, you know, is it time? How do you talk to your partner about this? Now, it may be that you have that idea in your head and you say, you know what? I know. I want to get a divorce. I want to move forward with this. Other people, they don't know. But this expectation setting is very important because you need to know what information are you going to need to have. Now, we did tests at Stanford Law School. I'm, I'm a fellow at Stanford Law School. I've been there for the last 15 years. And we did tests where we provided this information from a human, and we provided this information from an algorithm. And what we found is that people actually trust this information more from a wizard, an online wizard, than they do from a human, which a lot of the lawyers didn't like that. But why is that the case? If you go see a lawyer, that lawyer is sizing you up. That lawyer is looking at you. They're probably asking themselves, is the divorce this person's fault? Do they have a lot of money? Do they have a lot of assets? Is this a good client for me to have, or do I not want to get into this? Is this going to be a mess? There's a lot of issues that happen, and it's embarrassing to go to a, to a human and talk through all of the problems in your marriage. People avoid that, and a lot of people stay in bad marriages because they're so worried about the shame associated with going through this. If you provide this on the Internet, there's no shame. That's fine. Open up an incognito window. Knock yourself out. And if you go through the wizard and you answer the questions and you get an outcome you don't like, fine, start over. Answer them a different way. See how it changes the outcome. People are very savvy at about how to use these types of mechanisms. So we want to put a wealth of content on the Internet so that anyone can find it 
And then if they're in that situation where they're trying to figure out what am I going to do next, they can come and they can get this information. Okay, so imagine you go through this, you do your relationship test, and you decide, you know what? I do want to proceed. I do want to get a divorce. So then we go to the next step, which is a workbook, which is the intake process. What information do we need to get from you to begin the divorce process? So the first thing we do, we provide the terms and conditions. We explain how this works. You're about to create an account. And then you put in your information. You put in all your information. And then you put in the information about your spouse. Then we ask you, do you have any kids? OK, you see those circles at the top? We've created a set of 18 questions that have to be answered, that have to be negotiated between the two spouses. If you can answer those 18 questions, you have all of the information that you need to create a separation plan. Now we have six other questions that we ask that are not for negotiation. It's just you. It's you thinking about what kind of future do you want to have? How do you, you know, what kind of relationship do you want to have with your kids? What, what, they're more reflection questions for you. But these 18 questions are structured in those circles at the top. And when you go through this workbook, we take you through every single step. Now if you go, if we say, how many, how many kids do you have under 18? And you say zero, fine. The, the children's circle grays out. You don't have to answer those questions. But if you do have kids under 18, then you need to go through this process. The other thing we have is we have pre-configured solutions that were designed by family counselors and psychologists because we know they work. So if you're thinking about co-parenting, okay, you can come in, and it's almost like a McDonald's menu. Option one, option two, option three, or you can build whatever you want. You can design your own solution. But the thing is, if you know that you want the kids to live with dad and see mom on the weekends, or you know you want the kids to live with mom and see dad on the weekends, or you want to do a straight 50-50 split where there's co-parenting and they go back and forth, those options are pre-configured. And this is what we call an online dis uh, dispute resolution, a solution database. We can create a database of solutions that we know are effective, and we can present them to the disputants and say, do any of these solutions look good? If you just go into a lawyer, they give you a blank legal pad and say, okay, what do, you, what do you think? And that's very hard if you've never had a dispute before. You don't know what's going to work. So this can be very powerful. So you go through this intake process. We screen for things like domestic violence. So if there's a past of violence or abuse, we find that out in this platform and then we take people off the online process and we put them into an in-person process. Because what you don't want to have happen is they're going through an online process and then there's a threat of violence and then there's not a human mediator that's involved. So we do that screening in the process. So then imagine you go through that workbook and you provide all of your answers as to what you think the answers to those 18 questions should be. Then we contact the spouse automatically and the spouse goes through and the spouse goes through that workbook as well. Now when they go through the workbook they don't see your answers. But as soon as they finish the workbook, we open up an online collaborative workspace where the two, the, the two couples, the husband and the wife, or the husband and the husband, or the wife and the wife, they can come in and they can work together in that environment to reach agreement. So this is before the other, the other spouse logs in. And once they log in, you're notified. And then we open this up. Now, this is what we call in dispute resolution a single text negotiation. It works just like Google Docs. So you can see. When one party types in text, it's highlighted in one color. When the other party types in text, it's highlighted in another color. And we give them the structure of an agreement. They need to fill out the missing components in that agreement. And the goal is to get both spouses to click this button, the agreed button. If both sides, they say, this text here, I'm OK with it, you're OK with it, great. That means we've reached agreement on this component of the separation plan. And you can see, I don't know if you guys can see this laser. But up here, we have a tracker. And the tracker shows how much agreement you've already achieved. Do you see the white circles outside of the circles at the top? That shows how much you've completed of each of those areas. Now let me be clear. You don't log in and get a divorce in 30 minutes. This is not a quickie thing. Some people, it takes months for them working through this platform to negotiate the separation, to figure out all the details that they need to work out. Now, OK, so you have this process. The other thing we have, we have a, one, we have a free dial-in number, a 1-800 number there. So you can dial in. You can talk to somebody from the Dutch Legal Aid Board. We also have tools like calculators. You can click that calculator on the side. What this does is it brings up a an online spreadsheet. And you can put in all your assets, just high level. What's in your bank account? What's the value of your house? What kind of cars do you have? And it will automatically generate a suggested amount for spousal support or for child support. Now, we didn't come up with this. This is actually generated by the Dutch government. But we can put it right in the tool. And it's not binding. It's advisory. So you can get this number, and it's a suggestion. And then you and your spouse can then continue to negotiate it. 
Um, so imagine you go through that negotiation process, but you still can't reach agreement. You still can't come up with a, a statement that the two of you have authored that you're both willing to click agree on. So what you can do is you can click that button, mediate. And when you click that button, you have to pay. Now, all of the registration is through uh, DigiD. No, DigiD is the payments. And then there's a Dutch, what's the thing with the Dutch government where you log in with your ID number? It's DigiD? Well, uh, anyway, so use DigiD to log in. But there's also payments. All of this goes through the government. It's not coming through our platform. We've integrated with all of those services. But so you pay a little amount to pay for the cost of the mediator. And that is based on your income level as well. So if you're a low income person, you don't actually pay anything. But once you get that, we say these are the mediators that are online and ready to help you right now. These are mediators that have been pre-qualified. They're very experienced family mediators. And we ask each party to pick two that they were willing to work with. We give them a little bio, and they can look at those people. And they pick two, which means there's always going to be one selection in common between the two sides. And as soon as you make that selection, that person logs in to the room here, and they participate with the two of you. And they can actually type in the window as well, the single text as well, and it's highlighted as a different color. Now, they can't click agree. You still have to click agree. But the mediator can help you. And you can see down at the bottom, we can't see it that well, but we have a discussion environment where you can post messages back and forth and you can talk over possibilities and say, what about this or what about that? Where are the kids going to be for Christmas? Who's going to pay for summer camp? How are we going to get him back and forth from you know, soccer practice? All those questions can be worked out. Okay, we also have, you can see right next to it, we have a decision button. And if you can't work it out through negotiation and you can't work it out through mediation, you can click that decision button and you'll actually get a family court judge to log into the case as the arbitrator and they'll ask some questions back and forth between the parties and then they will fill out that box and hit save and then it's part of your separation plan. Okay, so just like I showed you, Diagnosis, negotiation, mediation, and then evaluation if necessary. Okay, so then you go through this process and then you can see your entire, entire separation plan. This is the actual text that you authored with your spouse or with a mediator or with the arbitrator. And once you get this full separation plan complete, you can click a button and you can submit it to the Dutch Legal Aid Board. Now the Dutch Legal Aid Board, uh, the ROD, they have lawyers that will come in and evaluate your separation plan and make sure that it's within the guardrails of Dutch law. Because sometimes, I mean, you can imagine, if you have a divorce, maybe one spouse has cheated on the other spouse. And they say, I feel so bad, I'm so sorry. Take the house, take the car, take the kids, take all the money. I'm going to live in a cardboard box by the river. I'm so sorry, I am a horrible person. Well, that may make them feel better for five minutes, but that's not sustainable. That's a disaster if you have an agreement like that. So this legal review stage makes sure that an attorney looks at the agreement agreed to by the parties, and if they say this is not sustainable, this is not within the guardrails of Dutch law, they push it back to the parties. And then the parties can go in and continue to negotiate it to come up with an outcome that's, that's legally acceptable. But once it passes legal review, then it's automatically submitted to the Dutch Legal Aid Board and filed with the courts, and there you go. The divorce is complete. So that means no attorney is required and no in-person appearances in the court are required either. Now the last step, which is very interesting, is aftercare, okay? So most of the time when you do a separation agreement, as soon as you have the separation agreement filed with the court, you're done. Okay, thank you very much, good luck. But with this platform, we keep this environment open because it may be that you wanna go back and consult. What agreement did you come up with? You know, did we agree that it was gonna be Christmas was going to be with, with me or Christmas was going to be with you. You can go back and refer to it. Or you can renegotiate certain points. Maybe after you try out the agreement, it doesn't work. It needs to make adjustments. Or you may need to share documents or you like share report cards or figure out financial arrangements for the future. All of that's available in this platform. So this becomes an online home that enables the two disputants not only to resolve the initial dispute they have, which is the terms of the separation, but also to make sure that that agreement continues and stays healthy and they can adjust it as they move forward. Any comments or questions on this? I know this is a lot different. You probably thought we were gonna talk about e-commerce when we first sat down, but yes, please. What is the identification? Yeah, so how do the people get identified? Uh, if it's really them, uh, if it's their partner filling the other, the other side filling it out? Uh, how do it's you an excellent that? question. So we do use the authentication mechanism of the Dutch government. So my understanding when you log into any government sites or even the hospitals, you have to log in with a certain 
uh, uh, identification. So we essentially use that authentication mechanism as a proxy. Now, we don't have that in the United States. So, uh, you know, for some, for some reason, American citizens are very resistant to the government having I identification information for them. So then we do have to do some authentication mechanisms. And that may be two-factor authentication. Our platform can do that. So we can use people's phones as a backup to make sure that their password isn't compromised or something like that. But it's an excellent question. I have seen very few circumstances where somebody pretends to be someone else when they log into a dispute. And then the other party goes, well, wait a minute, I don't know who actually typed that. But there are circumstances where someone has their lawyer log in as them and participate. So it is, it is a very interesting question of identity here. Because if you're doing a face-to-face -face divorce mediation, you know you're talking to your spouse. But online, are you sure? Are you sure you're talking to them? And who are they sharing that information with? We do a lot of work on encryption and privacy and things to make sure this information is not compromisable. But you never know. Someone can copy something off a web page and send it or take a screenshot. So it's a key issue. Yes, another question? Around here somewhere? A question? Okay, no worries. Uh, think about what questions you want to ask because there's going to be more time for that. How are we doing? All right, we've got 15 more minutes. I've only got one or two more slides. This is what it looks like in Dutch. So I showed you the English example. Maybe I should have showed you the Dutch example, but it helps me. My Dutch is non-existent. I can't even figure out what buttons to push when I want to proceed. But we have it in Dutch. We also work in Swedish. We work in Spanish. So a lot of uh, cross-lingual cases you can imagine in e-commerce because uh, in Europe, you might have a Polish person having a dispute with a French person or a Spanish person having a dispute with a Swedish person. So you have to be able to do that translation in real time. Okay, this is another system that we built in uh, British Columbia. And you can see there's other kinds of disputes we've also integrated. So we do wills and we do uh, landlord-tenant and we do other kinds of things. Eventually, I think the vast majority, just like I remember when they first introduced ATMs to get money out of the bank, and all the bankers said, no one's going to use these ATMs because you want to have a relationship with your banker. You want a person. You don't trust a machine with your money. What if they give you the wrong amount of money? You can't negotiate with them. When was the last time you went into a bank? These ATMs are so smart now. No one goes into banks anymore. So I'm arguing that that's going to happen to the law as well. Right now, the law is a human-powered process. The software is getting stronger and better and faster, and we're getting smarter about how to do this. Eventually, you're never going to need a lawyer, and you're never going to need to go into a court because you're going to have mechanisms like this. And that's what they're doing in British Columbia. All right, so this is another example of missed mortgage payments. When you're paying a mortgage on your house and you miss one, you can come on and go through a debt restructuring and negotiation process. But I won't get into too much of that. All right, so I'll open up, up for questions in a second. but. The assertion that I'm making to you guys is this. I mean, we're here at Campus Party. So many smart hackers here. I mean, obviously, the hardware is incredible. The 3D printing, the virtual reality, it's amazing. But I'm arguing that legal technology, building the software that is going to be able to resolve disputes like this, this is the next big business. This is a multi-hundred billion dollar business. All of the money that goes to lawyers today, I don't know if there's any lawyers in the audience. No offense, but you're in trouble unless you understand where things are going. There are a lot of lawyers out there. I present to judges, I present to lawyers, and they say, no, we're not going to allow this change to happen. We're not going to allow technology to transform the law. Well, good luck with that, because it's transformed every other industry, and it's going to transform the law. And what it's going to enable us to do is provide access to justice to more people so that people can get fast and fair resolutions. And instead of you having to take a day off from work and drive down to a courthouse and sit there and wait for your case to be called, you're going to be able to resolve your disputes sitting in bed on a Saturday night with a laptop on your lap and a glass of Merlot on your bedside table, which is the best time for you to think about how do I really want to deal with co-parenting for my kids? How do I want to resolve this issue? People are at their best when you give them the flexibility to handle these matters on their own time frame, and that's what technology lets us do. It lets parties deal with these issues asynchronously. So one of the things we say, uh, I'm from the alternative dispute resolution field, which is alternative to the courts, ADR. ODR is online dispute resolution, so it's not an alternative. This is the future. This is the default way that we're going to resolve our problems in the future. So if you're thinking about something that you want to start experimenting with, it's not just Modria. There's more than 100 companies around the world that are doing this work. But this is a very powerful emergent area of law. And citizens and consumers are going to require and demand. If you're going to run a merchant website, if you're going to even any website, a gaming website, you have to provide resolutions. And we're seeing now gaming companies. Uh, my, my kid is obsessed with Dota. 
There's a Dota dispute resolution process. There's a League of Legends dispute resolution process. There's a World of Warcraft dispute resolution process. I've resolved so many disputes over swords and armor and skins, I can't even tell you because, you know, these disputes are real. And you cannot build a face-to-face -face resolution process. It's irrelevant for those types of cases. So I think that this is the best way to expand access to justice. So why don't I open it up? I see we have a couple more questions. So uh, please, ask away. Try and stump me. All right. So uh, how do you deal with the um, problem of complexity of the of problems and forcing people to answer questions or giving information so you can convert them and uh, check them according to digital rules? Because Absolutely. That's like a big barrier, right? So that's a great question. Um, so there are lots of ways that we handle that. The first thing is, what I found in dispute resolution is, you don't want to build a generic resolution process and then put cases into it. You want to build lots of dispute resolution processes that are specific to different problem types. Okay. So the courts, if you look at it, the courts are not specific to any kind of dispute. If I have a landlord-tenant case or a divorce case or a workplace case, I go into the court. It's the same, same basic mechanism. But for online dispute resolution, we, one of the things we say in dispute resolution is fit the forum to the fuss. Fit the resolution process to the needs of the dispute. So when we have a very complicated, I mean, at eBay, I thought, well, these are dumb disputes. They're low dollar value disputes are very simple. Actually, they're very complicated. But we had hundreds of millions of disputes coming through. We had a giant data warehouse with all of the disputes in it. So we could build learning systems that were constantly thin slicing these disputes and providing appropriate options for each kind of dispute. So that's one thing. Now, you talk about rules-based resolutions. One of the things that Modria does is we actually have a policy center. And you can go in and you can code your own rules in Groovy. So you can say, for instance, at eBay, we knew if someone called us with an item not received dispute, if they called us on the phone, that cost eBay $15 in customer service time to pick up the phone, talk to the person on the phone. And maybe they didn't even work it out. Maybe they would call back again later. So if the dispute is worth $10, you should not require them to call in because eBay is going to pay $15 to resolve a $10 dispute. So you can write a rule that says, if this is the first time that this buyer has ever filed a dispute and the value of the dispute is less than $12, say, automatically provide a refund and send them an email that says, oh, I'm so sorry you had this experience. We've just given you an automatic refund because you're saving money and you're delighting the user because they get an instant resolution. Now, you can also code a rule, rule in Groovy that says, if the dispute is over more than $1,000, automatically escalate them to the white glove service team and have a customer service rep call them because then you want to spend the $15 to make sure that consumer is happy because they're buying high dollar value items. So being able to write these rules, it's not about auto decisioning all the time. Sometimes it's about, about auto routing. And if you build enough of these rules, they can start to look like an AI because you can say, if this is their first case, make them do this. If this is their second case, make them do this. And we also know a lot about these users. How long have they been on the site? How many disputes have they filed? What kind of item is it? What kind of shipping did they pay for? All of that information we have at our fingertips. So we can dynamically use that data in our data warehouse to build an appropriate resolution process that fits the forum to the fuss and handles the complexity. So that's just a sample. Your question is bigger than that, but that's an example of how we deal with some of those issues. So thank you. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I stood on that side. I didn't even didn't come over and look at you, but hello. Thank you for being uh, in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation also. Um, uh, can you explain a more in detail the sentence that appeared before on the screen? Sure. Um, Which one? Dynam dynamically tune of research over investment and loyalty? Sure, absolutely. That's a great question. I think it was on this slide. Well, maybe not. So let me tell you, because uh, we did a lot of research at eBay and PayPal because we had these hundreds of millions of disputes. So one of the things we found at eBay that's a little counterintuitive is we found users would rather lose a dispute quickly than win a dispute and have it take a long period of time. Because we were looking at something called net promoter score, which is a metric of satisfaction. So if someone lost their dispute within 24 to 48 hours, their satisfaction with that outcome was higher than if they won their dispute and got all their money back, but it took 12 days or more. So 12 days was when the frustration got. Now, why is that? Because you have an open dispute. It's just annoying. It's annoying to have to go back and not know what's happening. 
So we actually did a very large study at eBay where we looked at millions and millions of buyers, and they were in a, in a particular active month on the site. And we looked at how active they were, how many transactions they did in the six months prior to that active month, and how many transactions they did in the six months after that active month. And then we split them into two buckets, who had a dispute in the active month and who didn't have a dispute in the active month. Now, what we found at eBay is the reactivation rate for buyers is about 105%. So that means the average user is increasing their activity on eBay and PayPal by a little bit. What we found is that users that did not have a dispute increased their activity about 105%. Users that did have a dispute and went through our resolution process increased their activity at about 110, 111%. So that 6%, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars. Now, if you look at the type of outcome that they got, if somebody won their dispute and they worked it out through mutual agreement, their activity on eBay increased by 18% versus people that never had a dispute in the first place. Now, when I showed this information to the CEO, he said, you're telling me we should be giving our users disputes. I said, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when they have a dispute, that's the loyalty moment. Because that 18% lift is higher than the lift that we got through gift cards. It's higher than the lift we got through marketing. It was an incredibly high amount. Now, the other thing that was interesting is if someone filed a dispute and lost the dispute, they still reactivated at 107%, 108%. They reactivated at a higher rate than somebody who never had a dispute in the first place. Now, why would that be true? Because when you go through a resolutions process and you realize that a fast and fair mechanism is available to resolve those cases, then you say, the next time you sit down to buy an item, you go back to that website. You go back to eBay. If you, if you have a process where there isn't a resolution, and you, you, you say you buy a game, and you give it to your nephew, and it's, and it's a PS3 game, and he goes, oh, I've got a Wii. And then you go on the website, you can't figure out how to return the problem. You look everywhere. You, you, you send emails, no one responds to you. The next time you sit down to buy a video game, you're not going to go back to that website. But if you learn, if you invest in figuring out how to solve the problem and you have the confidence that there is a fast and fair resolution there, then your activity increases. So I think you're, you're talking about reactivation and activity and loyalty. And I think that there's a lot of data that shows that these processes are one of the most cost effective ways to increase that. Did I answer your question? Uh, a little bit. Do you want to pro ask more or should we move on? Okay, all right. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you have any open software for this kind of uh, algorithms that you have, like to make more popular to people build websites with that technology? Absolutely. Well, uh, you're actually sitting in front of a colleague of mine from PayPal, Christian, uh, and he uh, is a consultant, and he actually uses Modria's technology to build lots of kinds of resolution systems. Sorry, Christian, I wanted to co-present with you, but I went on a little bit earlier than we thought. But uh, So we actually do have open source uh, dispute resolution platforms that are available. Uh, Modria bought a company called Jurapax, which was one of the leading online dispute resolution platforms. It was actually based here in the Netherlands, and we've open sourced some of that technology. But Modria is an enterprise SaaS multi-tenant platform, and it's configurable by configurators. So Christian has a team of configurators that we create instances of Modria, and then his configurators will go in and tweak it for different types of dispute volumes. So we do, uh, you know, I teach classes on online dispute resolution and we provide instances of Resolution Center for people to experiment with. So if you'd like one, give me a call. Actually, actually my information is at the end of the slides, and, uh, and then I'll send one to you, and you can play with it. But it's actually it's all built in Java. It's all open. It's, you know, it's based on MySQL and Tomcat and things like that. Um, so it's all standard technologies. We have a full API. It's fully documented. We have a full set of webhooks in the platform. So here's my contact info. If anybody wants to play with these tools, just hit me up here at this email, and I can send it to you. Yes, other questions? In the corner was the first one. Um. Um, uh, do you think that this idea could be uh, to create smart contracts? So for example, you would have contracts from one company, big companies, and another sure. contract from another company, and then these companies would be communicating with each other without getting any lawyers involved. Absolutely. So what you see is companies now, when they negotiate contracts, they put in a clause. And the clause says, if we ever have a dispute about this contract, we're going to resolve it with online dispute resolution. 
which means you always have a redress process before going to court. And a lot of general counsels and legal officials in technology companies, they will put in these clauses into every agreement because they want to prevent the costs that's associated with going to court. Now, this is a little bit controversial in the U.S. because now court companies are starting to do this with consumers, and consumers are not necessarily informed about their legal rights. So there's a lot of debate about whether or not that's okay. In Europe, they don't do that. But business to business, definitely they put clauses into the contracts that require resolution mechanisms like this. Now, I don't know if you guys have heard a lot about the blockchain. You know, this is a big part of Bitcoin. Everybody's talking about the blockchain now. There are a lot of people that are looking at the blockchain to do contract enforcement. So you can imagine if you reach an agreement here, you could actually put that agreement into the blockchain and it could be an enforcement mechanism. So you could pay with Bitcoins or Ethercoins or whatever you want to do. But we're very excited about the potential of enforcement from these kind of software-based enforcement mechanisms because now we really don't need a court. People can reach an agreement and put into the contract that they agree to enforce their outcome via these other mechanisms, and then you don't need judges, you don't need jails, you don't need because it's all integrated into the platform. So that's part of the radical distributed nature of ODR. So great question. All right, we're getting to the end. More but questions? Yes, I was wondering what would happen to the juror system uh well, your you guys, legal system. You guys don't have jurors in the Netherlands, no. right? That's very interesting because in the United States, we talk a lot about 12 angry men. Let me give you another example. At eBay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, digress. But at eBay, we created something called the community court. And this is where if two users have a dispute, these are for feedback disputes. eBay can't decide feedback disputes because we have to remain arm's length. We're a publisher of feedback. We can't vet it for accuracy. So if two users have a dispute, they could go to the community court and they both provide their case, their perspective, and then we create a jury of randomly selected eBay community members. Now these are people that have previously applied to be jurors and they have to meet certain eligibility criteria and we test them to make sure they've never transacted with the two users that have the dispute. And then each of them reviews the information from the two users and they render a decision and whoever gets a majority of the votes wins the case and eBay enforces the outcome. Now we did like 30, 40,000 of those cases and actually Mark Plots right now, because eBay owns Mark Plots, they're still using that technology. Although they call it the Gebreukers jury. Um, because, I don't know, juries doesn't mean as much as like community panels. But Taobao, which is a site of Alibaba, they've used that same mechanism and they're resolving millions of disputes a year. So that's a fusion between democracy and justice that's not possible in the face-to-face -face world. For a $50 dispute, you'd never convene a jury of 50 people. But technology can possible. So the juries, online juries, a very interesting possibility for community, communities generate disputes and then communities can resolve those disputes as well supported by an algorithm. Okay, yes, please, your question. You kind of answered the, my question by... Sorry. Well, you opened up by talking about Fintech. And, Fintech, And yeah. then you returned to it just now by Ether, uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, yeah? Absolutely. Um, well, these are decentralized systems, decentralized uh, technologies. And again, you said it gets rid of the need for a judge or for a jail or for a enforcing system because it is in the math, yeah? That's right. Um, but as on the contrary, you see something like, have you heard about Ross, the artificial intelligence? Oh, the, uh, a the, the, the lawyer. lawyer. The lawyer, yeah, yeah. right. So you say also in your presentation, yeah, the future of uh, dispute resolution, digital dispute resolution doesn't look like the traditional law, law system, but here we have an example of the ultimate lawyer coming out and, you know. Well, the ultimate lawyer. Let's go try Ross. Let's see how he really does. I mean, I, I know I work with a lot of guys that are experimenting with Watson, but the problem is, here's the thing. There are a lot of legal tech startups that are trying to say, let's build digital lawyers, let's build digital courts, let's help lawyers do their research you know, with AIs. But the problem is, they're not fundamentally changing the system. You know, The thing about Silicon Valley is we want to disrupt antiquated systems. So you look at Airbnb, right? How far would Airbnb have gotten if they were selling to Hyatt and Hilton and Marriott? They wouldn't have gotten anywhere. They would have gotten squashed. How far would Uber have gotten if they were selling to the taxi associations? Nowhere. You have to build a new system from scratch that works better. So the notion of building a digital judge is you're using technology to implement the old model. These diagnosis wizards that I'm talking about do the same thing that a judge, I'm not a judge, a lawyer, 
do the same thing that a lawyer does. They can look at millions and millions of articles. They can give you solutions. They can educate you about what your options are and help you think through those possibilities. I think that that's a better model for the future of justice than building digital judges and building digital lawyers and building digital courtrooms and somehow having all these AIs communicate with each other in the old mechanism. That's old school, man. That wasn't the way we resolved disputes 200 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago. This is what the future of resolutions is going to look like, and it's based on negotiation where people work out the problems themselves assisted by software. So maybe I'm being unrealistic. I, I mean, I have a little self-interest in this. I'm running an ODR company. But I want, to dis I want to blow up the old system and build something that's better as opposed to just use technology to streamline an existing system which is out of date. So. Thank you so much. We're out of time, but it uh, was uh, very much Thank worth you. the extra time. I'd say onto a more justice uh, society in the near future, Absolutely. right? Okay, great. Uh, will you be around in the Speakers Cafe for some more Q&A? Definitely. Okay. If anybody has any questions, I'll be right over here at the you side. Know where I'm to happy find to give you a Colin. card. And if you want to play with the technology, I would love that. So thank you so much for having me. It was great. It was very interesting.